just one of those mayor up in the mayor up in the mayor up in the mayor kind of thing. Um, okay. What's the what do you think is the um, what's the goal of this person in writing this? What what's the what's the overall message that that's is coming through in this in this little piece of writing here? Why did this person sit down and write this little picture? What's the question? What's so nobody just sits down to write something just for just for fun, right? What what was the person's goal? What do you think the person's goal was in writing this piece? What is kind of the message that's coming through to you? Um, what is the tone, I guess you'd say, uh, in in this writing? What do you think this person's viewpoint is? Um, so that really you asked me what was the question and I gave you like 45 questions there, but that's kind of what I'm looking for is to say whenever you read something uh, you should be thinking about what is this person trying to do with their, with their writing, right? What, what is this? What they're trying to say that see the cancer with the distant ancestors from uh, amphibian? Trying to disprove that. Yeah. Okay. So there, there's, there's trying to disprove, um, really they're trying to poke holes in this idea that this, this type of fish, coelacanths, um, are related to the distant, well they're really they're trying to poke holes in the idea that they're missing link. Okay. Because what, what's the, the history is, there were fossil records of coelacanths for many, many years, right? And the thought was, and what did the paleontologist tell us about those fossils? Um, they thought that, that the ceiling camp had like an undeveloped lung. Okay. And all we know was a was a flat uh, swim bladder. Okay, so not not what the new recent discoveries tell us, but what did what did paleontologists say about the, the fossils of ceiling camps? What did the paleontologist say? Okay, so we talked about actinoturgia, that PTER part being the, the limb or the wing, and we talked about those, all those fish have ray fins. So the attachment to the body is just these flimsy bones like this. Right, versus sarcophagy, that's, I think actino means uh, maybe like rays or something like that. Sarco means fleshy. And they, their fins are attached to the body via a bone. Okay. What's the significance of that? this versus this it's a very different design right it's a very different uh anatomy why is this significant when they found fish like this yeah if you draw like if you lay fish out on the back and you say okay here's the head and here's the here's the mouth and there's the, the gills and there's the tail, right? And we have here's the fins, right? And then we have a person, right? It's this John Tyler or Felix, right? right? This could this be a mall, I guess. Right? Could these two organisms? have the similar bone, could this basically be homologous to our femur, right? Could this be a different pathway that ended with us, right? One pathway goes along to all the fishes and another evolutionary pathway begins with some type of fish that has a 
bone attachment, right? And we'll talk about how that's related or why that's functionally significant. But could this be the missing link? Right? Could this be sort of a transitional fossil that explains the pathway that ends, sort of fills in the, in the blank? Right? So we have a split. These are the other fish. And then here are the tetrapods. Could the sarcopterygian, or could the coelacanth rather, be this missing link between whatever this was and tetrapods, right? So the promising, uh, the promising indications that coelacanths could be a missing link were, of course, the bone and the arm. But what else? What else did this, about the coelacanth sort of suggested that they could be the missing link? There's kind of one other thing that they. They talk about maybe the Pantherian's game. Okay, so that that's that kind of getting into um, one thing we notice is that if something is a, 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 a transitional fossil, it's usually not living, right? We want to know what the first, uh, you know, the, the transition between cartilaginous fish and bony fishes. We're really never going to know what this organism is. Why? Because they're extinct. Right? They don't live into the future. They're not extinct. So the fact that it was extinct is, is a, would would be promising. And then the lung. I'm thinking of the lung. And so I said that they have a primitive lung. So again, how do we? We have fish down here with gills, and then we have tetrapods out there with lungs. We're going to have to have something that has something in between, right? The seal can't seem to fit that bill. But aha, what did our, our, our author tell us about this just preposterous idea? Once they, um, uh, this, this is true, that in the 30s, there was a um, biologist in South Africa walking in a fish market, and he looks over, and there's a damn coelacanth that somebody had caught and was selling for, for food, right? And like the guy said, it would be like, um, could have been more surprised if he was walking down the road and saw a dinosaur, right? So then they discovered that coelacanths were actually, yes, they were extant. There were, um, I think, two species. There's one place in Indonesia you can just snorkel and you can scuba dive and see these things. And when they started to study them, it, it did not look promising for this idea, right, of them being transitional fossils. But, And I guess my point is, the author of this paper seems to want to take this and say, therefore, evolution is a bunch of hooligan, right? But just how, how else could you interpret that? If you know about evolution, the fact that seal cans aren't the missing link is not surprising at all, right? How do you explain the fact that they have a gas fat-filled bladder, air bladder? They don't have a long lap effect over the gas bladder. Not that they live in little swampy areas where they're going to walk out onto land. They live down in, deep in the ocean. Right? But this is not surprising. This is not, does not fly in the face of evolution. Right? How else can you interpret this? What's the, the proper way to interpret the, the, the coelacan and how they look so different and, and all of that? Right. What's the best way to interpret? What is the coelacanth relative to? Here are the tetrapods over here. Okay. Uh, the, here's the transition. Took place here. These are all fish. All of these. Really all of these guys. We can include the hackfish and lampreys in that too. And then here's the tetrapods. Okay. Is the seal obviously the seal camp is not the missing link? Right? What is the seal camp? 
Where would the missing link be on this diagram? Okay, uh, and the long, and remember, really, what did we say that the longest homologous to the swim bladder? So way back here, this becomes the long. That that develops way back here. But where's where would the missing? We, here's the question. Well, here's the transition that we are curious about. What's the missing link? Is it going to be up here? Where's the missing link? It's going to be down here someplace. Right? Do you like this one down? This would be the missing link. Be here. Right? What is the coelacanth? The coelacanth is the living relative of the missing link. Okay. Could this missing link have had something that kind of looked like a long and lived in an area that was was moving out onto land? Right. Yeah, but it's been extinct for a long time. Right. What is the coelacanth? It basically, they've been evolving. We see them been evolving for millions of years. So the fact that they're long, their swim bladder turned into a fat filled bladder is not surprising. It became, it's become adapted to whatever the coelacanth pitch is over millions of years. Okay, this is very similar to the idea you can take. You can uh, the analogous situation is this: we have humans, we have who's our closest living relative? Yeah, chimpanzees. What are those? Uh, chimpanzees. different species. A lot of people say, well, obviously, uh, I did not evolve from a monkey, right? I did not evolve from a chimpanzee. Of course, yes, we can all agree on that, right? What's the real situation? We didn't evolve from chimpanzees. What's the better way to interpret this? Common ancestors. Chimpanzees and humans evolved from a common ancestor. Okay. And in between, what do we know about this story? We probably won't get a lot of time to talk about this. There was a whole bunch of other things that went extinct. Australopithecus, all the other species of homo. Right? We're not seeing the missing link is back here someplace. Okay. So it's the same situation as the coelacanth. Yes, the coelacanth is does not have the same anything ecologically like a missing link would expect but that's because it isn't the missing link is it evolved from the missing link okay so you see my my point is people misinterpret this, this would be kind of like saying um here's another analogy that, that i think of if we use real recent uh time historical time i'm going to say okay here is here is your grandmother, and evolving from the grandmother is your all of her children, and coming from her children would be this is your aunt, this is your grandma, this is your this is you, this is your mom, right? this is your cousin. That's like saying, did you evolve from your cousin? No, your, your, you and your cousin evolved from your grandmother. Uh, it was evolved from somebody way back here. That's not, probably not a lot. Right? We are related. Tetrapods are related to coelacanths. Humans are related to chimpanzees. But we did not evolve from those entities. Okay? So that's my point. It's a belabored point. Um, but it's good to start thinking about how to actually interpret these these type of fossils. And you'll see people interpret things incorrectly, which um, I think is dangerous, right? So let's look at this. Um, 
look at this PowerPoint. Uh, let's see, contract fees. We have talked about the offset fees on the regular fishes. We're getting to the sarcophagus and low thin fishes. Okay. Steel cans and lungfish are more closely related to tetrapods than they are to ray thin fish. Okay. So like the coelacanth that we're talking about in here is a fish, but they're actually more closely related to amphibians than they are to black bass. Okay. Why so many species? Because all of the amphibian, reptile, birds, and mammals are included in this group as a clade. Right? If it, you want to keep it monophyletic, sarcophagians need to include from all of these. The few living species of actual um, lobes and fishes, and then all the tetrapods. Are included here. Okay. And the key character that unites them as a group is that their fins or limbs are attached by a single bone. CF means compared to, compared to the several bones in the actinome trachea. So it's that single bone attachment to the rest of the body. <clears throat> here is the one we've been talking about. Actinomystia. Okay. It is an order, so it can't form these. There are only two species that, ex that are extant. Um, they have been kicking it for a long, long time. This is a species, a group that has been here for at least 65. Well, no, they disappeared from the fossil record 65 million years ago. They're old, even older than that. Um, fleshy basis of the, the fins, and again, that fat filled swim bladder um, is not useful for respiration. It is probably something here than buoyancy. When you um, when you see fat in a fish, and this is the case with all the chondrophies. What is fat? Uh, what's the density of fat relative to water? If you have a really fatty liver or a fat-filled swim bladder, what's that going to do for a fish? Is it going to make them sink or make them float? Float, right? So a lot of fish um, deal with a buoyancy issue by having a lot of oils in their body, right? but they breathe through gills. And they are not using their swim bladder at a long. <laughs> and here's some pictures of what it feels like. Very strange. A strange fish. You see that bone bone here. They have rays on part of their fin, but, but attachment to the rest of the body would be a long single bone. Another group of sarcophagians, these are the lung fishes, the tropical um, fishes. This is more what I think you would expect to see in a transitional. They are not transitional fossils because they are living, but they do kind of fit with what you would expect. They live in um, very uh, low oxygen conditions, and they can use their, their lung which again formerly was the gill, the, the swim bladder is now a, a full blown lung. They can come to the surface of the water and pull atmospheric oxygen. Found um, in Australia, this is a genus of lung fishes from Australia. Too common with genera um, from South America and then Africa. So they primarily use their lung to get oxygen. We see a lot of adaptations here for a drying aquatic ecosystem. So they live in these places that dry up seasonally, and they'll actually 
form a little cocoon and then just live in a totally dry uh, lake bed for, for months or something. Then when the rain comes, they come back out of that cocoon and they can live in the water. So uh, very different than most fishes that we think about. Here's some different. Most fishes see that single bone attachment to the body. Um, and yeah, those are the long fishes are different. Okay. And then that brings us to the tetrapods. Okay. As a, a type of fleshy fin fish. And that includes our amphibians. Reptiles we're gonna see um, Whenever we see this quotations around a group, it is not a monophyletic group. We'll discuss um, why this is not really a good group, the reptiles, right? Um, and it, this divergence took place a long time ago, 360 years. So remember, um, the chondrichthys split off from the other fishes. 400 million years ago. So the first tetrapods evolved pretty quickly um, a long period of time ago. And these are some of our, um, again, these fossils that would be sort of transitional fossils that, that um, happened. They uh, lived during this time period. That's what we can think of kind of this time period here when three four hundred million years ago when uh, the sarcopterians were sort of sorting out into two main groups the dipnoi and the coelacanths and then the tetrapods okay and so we see a lot of these transitional um, characteristics the the here's another handout i think this sort of one page uh, from the back hand down. No. <clears throat> and this I feel like is just useful to kind of summarize a lot of the, the information about this transition from aquatic to terrestrial tetrapods. And it discusses the morphological characters that had to change. Right? Discusses some of the, the organisms that show the change, and it talks about what the advantages were um, to the change. Okay, so why was that morphological change adapted for existence in a terrestrial environment? So that's going to be the big topic of discussion for this this lecture. Really, is how did we go from aquatic to terrestrial? What, what kind of changes had to happen? And so here's some of those organisms that we see. Um, one thing that we see is a lot of changes in the skull. Okay, here's used the nocturne. See the shape of the skull more conical. Right. We get into acanthostega, and really all of the vertebrates that, that became terrestrial, common theme is that the skull is flattened this way. Right. What's the functional significance of having a flat skull versus having a conical skull? This one was this species really is probably our best guess at something that would have been, um, you know, right at this junction, a true transitional fossil. Look at that flattened skull. Looks like a modern amphibian. Right? The flattened skull has to do with uh, probably these organisms were 
in the water. These were all aquatic. These were fish type things. Right. Can't just think of lived in water. This wasn't a terrestrial animal, right? but it lived in the water and was also using the terrestrial. It, it was at the interface between the, the atmosphere and the water. And so coming up to the surface of the water, being able to see above the surface of the water, being able to go air, right? Um, and also probably eating things that were, that were out of the water. The flattened skull is um, very beneficial. Um, let's see, pectoral girdle. All right. What do you see the pectoral girdle on this picture? Okay, up by the head. All, right. All this here. This is your shoulder, scapular rib. Okay. Was the fish pectorals girdle look like? Fish skeleton. Not really much of a skin. Of a, of a girdle there, right? We don't see that connection. No, it's connected to the to the bony skull, but where does the pectoral girdle connect to on um, this? We can call them like a fisher pod. It's not really a fish pod, it's not really a fish, it's kind of in between the fish pod. Where's the pectoral girdle connecting to? Connects to the limb. Here's the upper arm bone, right? Connects the limb to the what? To the spine, right? If this organism has to push itself up off of the substrate, right? It needs to, it's all about transfer of, of force, right? If you want to trans, Basically, if, if this wasn't there and the, the, um, the limb tried to push up, what's going to happen? Right. The whole body is going to compress, right? There's nothing to transfer that energy, that force to. Here, the force is transferred to the spine through the pectoral muscle. Okay. That's allows the, the body to hold itself up off the suffering, right? Yeah. Um, now, I, I say that, but actually, uh, this is not a hard connection there. Just like in our upper arm bones, there is no actual specific connection to the, to the spine. It's really connected through um, ligaments and muscles and things like that. We have to stop moving. Yeah, we're getting close. Oh, you guys have to go. Okay. Okay. Um, the limbs themselves. All right. Um, again, we've talked about the upper arm bone, but what about the lower arm of all of these tetrapods? What do you notice about the lower arm? Here's again this here's a distinctly fish like organism. And then we're getting some of the more transitional fish and pod organisms here. In they're smaller in where? In the fish or the or the tetrapod? Which part? The bones and the Okay. So look at here. Here's that single upper arm bone. Right. But then when you get in the lower arm, a whole bunch of little bones, right? By the time we get down to here, where we have one upper arm bone and bigger, but two lower arm bones. Well, we have hands, 
Oh, and then, yeah, you get into the digits too. But here are the digits, so to speak, those rays, they can't really hold anything up. We can't transfer mass. They don't, they don't have uh, any rigidity to them, right? Um, but actually, these bones here are probably what might have evolved into our digits, right? Um, let's see, the limbs, it's all about weight transfer and mobility. So that it's about bearing the weight of this organism to be able to push it up off of the substrate. Amphibians can do that, they can hold themselves up. Right? There are, really are no fish. If you put a fish on a table, its belly is going to be touching the table, right? Because it can't, it can't do a push on basically. Um, we start out with lots and lots of limbs or digits, and eventually, I think there's another diagram that shows. Here's Houston Optron. Here's the Canstegian to look. We notice one upper arm bone, right? Even from the beginning, but then we sort into two forearm bones, and then eventually it sorts into five digits. I don't know what it is about five fingers, but it, we see it all across the dress of tetrapod lineage. Sometimes four, but usually five. This must be a proper. Um, I always think like about like robotics, you know, if you're making a robot to walk around on the on the ground and, and you put a whole bunch of fingers on there, I bet it wouldn't work as well as five fingers. I don't know what it is about that, about the way that they roll and move, right? Um, what about the rest of the skeleton, the rib cage and the spine? So we see the digits, the lower arm, upper arm, the girdles. But what about this part of the skeleton? What are some changes that we see from a fish to an amphibian? How do the spines differ? Okay, we'll go back to that fish skeleton. What about this? What about that spine? Or about the vertebrae? What do you notice about the vertebrae in, in fish? They're, they're all very similar. There's not a lot of specialization in the, in the vertebrae. Right? Each vertebrae are about the same. Okay? What are the ribs? Those ribs are just extensions off of the vertebrae. They're processes coming off of these. And what do you notice about as we transition to a more terrestrial organism? We see the ribs become more and more developed. These processes become larger. And what are these little things sticking off of the spine for? What's the function of those little? processes that come off of our vertebrae. Why are those there? Well, these little vertebrae, these little processes on this one. What do you suppose attaches to those? Bones, uh, uh, muscles, ligaments, things like that, right? In fact, th this is probably the most obvious example of this to me. In a Look at these huge processes on here. What do you suppose attach? What muscles do you suppose attach to there? They're involved with. They attach there. They go up onto the neck, right? You've got to have really strong muscles to hold that neck up. Those strong muscles need something to attach to. Right? The other example of this is the buffalo. 
So that's one of the um, one of the things that evolves is more processes. The ribs become more greatly developed. Okay, and all of this is basically acts just like a suspension bridge. Why? Because we now suddenly, when you move out onto land, what happens to your mass? Nothing. Right? What happens to your weight though? I'm just the weight of an animal when it moves out of the water. It's over. Hmm? Yeah, it's a lot heavier, right? Because there's no buoyancy holding the body up. So when you're standing on land, if you want your belly to be up off the ground, then you need to have a spine that's able to support the mass, right? And that only happens when you have those processes, you have the ribs, the, the rib cage holds in the viscera, all the intestines and things. Pretty much all the, the intestines and things are in here. Right? It protects the heart and the lungs. Right? Very important, become very important in a terrestrial um, environment. Um, on Wednesday.